Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 118th deck and it's titled You Can Fit So Much Exile in This Bad Boy. And if you haven't seen the show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So before we get into the actual deck tech, we got to take a second to highlight some of our social media accounts, some of the ways that you can help support the channel, and of course, some ways you can reach out to us as well. So in that order, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can find us over on Twitter at 13POYNZ, Reddit, u slash POYNZ13, and by email, dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. All of those are great ways to reach out and ask questions or maybe suggest cards that you would like to see turned into videos for this channel. All of those I try to check as much as possible, so if you ever send me a question or have a message for me, I will do my best to get to that when I can, but I do apologize if it takes me a little bit because I can't always be on them, can't always be checking. But if you are looking to support the channel a little bit more directly, you can also find us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Dungeon Learners Guide, where you can join the amazing people listed below, where we've got William Swiftfoot, Doodle, Calvin Schmidt, Eric Huey, Jeff Winger, and Jeffrey Boos. So to the six of you right now, thank you all so much for all of your support. And if you would like to join those six people, like I said, you can head on over to Patreon. You'll get access to things like the deck lists a week early. You'll get to see the unedited gameplay videos. You'll get to join a Discord where we actually brew up a lot of the decks and also where we play the games. So if you ever wanted to be in any of the games on this channel, that is the first place I look. And you also get the guarantee from me that any card you suggest will be turned into a video at some point for the channel. I will do my best to get to all of the suggestions from people in the comments on YouTube, over on Reddit, Twitter, that kind of stuff. But I can't guarantee it for anyone who is not a member of the patron, just because that's the easiest place for me to look. So again, thank you to everyone who is one of our patrons. And thank you, of course, to everyone who is watching. Please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And without any further ado, let's get into our deck tech. So first up, we got to talk about the random card of the week, which was suggested to us by Geist over on YouTube. And this card is Nasari Dean of Expression. So Nasari Dean of Expression is three red red for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature, Ifrit Shaman, that says at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of each opponent's library. And until the end of turn, you may cast spells from among those exiled cards and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Plus, whenever you cast a spell from exile, put a plus one plus one counter on Nasari Dean of Expression. Now, notably, Nasari is its own card, but it's not the full card. So if we're looking at turning this into a commander deck built around Nasari, and since Nasari is a legendary creature, he's going to be in the command zone, we also need to build around the rest of the card. So technically, we are built around a mono red creature but we're not built around a mono red card this is an is it commander so we have both blue and red because the other side of nasari is uvilda dean of perfection which is two and a blue for a two two Jin wizard you can tap her to exile an instant or sorcery card from your hand and put three hone counters on it it gains at the beginning of your upkeep if this card is exiled remove a hone counter from it and when the last hone counter is removed from this card if it's exiled, you may cast it. It costs four less to cast this way. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest. We are not built around Uvilda at all. We are 100% in on Nasari. So really, the blue is only here to help us with Nasari. Because if I'm being perfectly honest, I don't think Uvilda is that good. Being able to give stuff, essentially suspend three, but then still having to pay the mana, it just costs four less, isn't great. That's not really what we want to be doing. So instead... Let's talk a little bit about what we do want to be doing with some of our themes for this deck. And first up, we obviously want to build around Nasari as much as possible, so we are going to play with cards that care about being exiled and or cast from exile. So a great example of that is Sage of the Beyond, which is 5 blue blue for a 5-5 five five spirit giant. It's got flying, spells you cast from anywhere other than your hand, costs 2 less to cast, and it has foretell for 4 and a blue. So we can actually pay two to exile this card and then in the future pay four and a blue to cast it from exile, which would trigger Nasari putting a plus one plus one counter on it. And any spells we cast from anywhere other than our hand 
cost two less. So obviously Sage can't trigger on itself, but it can trigger on our other foretell cards or any other cards that are coming in from any other places in exile. So that is really our main theme. We want to make Nasari as big as possible, so that way we can cast a bunch of stuff from Exile and then start hitting our opponents. And so that leads us to our next theme, which is, of course, another way to cast something from Exile, which is Adventure. Now, it is important to note that Adventure doesn't cast from Exile immediately, but it does Exile the card, letting us cast the main part of the card from Exile, and then that can actually be affected by something like Sage of the Beyond, making it cost two less. So for example, we have two-handed axe, which is two and a red for an equipment. Whenever equipped creature attacks, double its power until the end of turn, equip for one and a red. We could just cast that normally, it costs three, but if we cast Sweeping Cleave for one and a red, it's an instant, target creature you control gains double strike until the end of turn, we then exile the adventure and can cast it later for the other half from exile. So if we have Sage of the Beyond, we cast Sweeping Cleave, give something double strike, then we cast Two-Handed Axe for only one red mana because we're casting it from somewhere other than our hand, and then we can equip it and give a creature double the power when it attacks, which is super, super useful when we're talking about Nasari, because we want Nasari to be as big as possible, so that way we can hit people as hard as possible. And then finally, that leads us to our third theme of the deck, and this one is Suspend. So really, we are all in on the Exile strategy, but we're focusing pretty heavy on the three different ways we can Exile, which are Fortell, Adventure, and Suspend. And an example of Suspend is Wheel of Fate, for a sorcery, suspend four for one and a red. You'll notice that it doesn't actually have a mana cost, so we can't cast it. But we can pay one and a red, suspend it, and then in our upkeep, we remove a time counter. When the last one is removed, we cast it. And when it's cast, each player discards their hand, then draws seven cards. Normally, we don't really want to be giving our opponents the card draw, but for the most part, this is going to be benefiting the entire table and hopefully kind of disrupting what our opponents are doing at the same time. But in general, it's going to be great card draw for us because we're going to put a bunch of cards into our hand that we can then try to exile by foretelling them or maybe going on an adventure or suspending them. So really, this is what our deck is all about. We are, like I said earlier, all in on Nasari. We want to make sure that Nasari is getting as big as possible, as quickly as possible, and then maybe using something like Two-Handed Axe to run our opponents over. But that is all of our themes for this week. And the next thing we got to do is talk a little bit about our key cards. These are going to be the cards that help us necessarily get to where we need to be, whether that's toward a win or just kind of accruing value as the game goes on. Either way, they're going to be really important for what we're trying to do. And the first of those key cards is going to be Mizzix Replica Rider. And Mizzix is four and a red for a four five legendary creature goblin wizard. It's got flying. And whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, such as exile, you may pay one and either a blue or a red. If you do, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. If the copy is a permanent spell, it gains haste and at the beginning of your end step, sacrifice this permanent. So since we are talking about casting so many things from exile, Mizzix is perfect for what we're trying to do. If we go back to two-handed axe, we cast that from exile, we pay one in a blue or one in a red, we make a copy of it, we now have two of the axes, we can equip them both to a creature, say Nasari, who is maybe at five power now, we attack, the first axe triggers, doubles his power to ten, and then the second axe triggers, doubles his power to twenty. If we've cast even just one more card from Exile, that is lethal commander damage in just one attack, almost essentially out of nowhere. So Mizzix is going to be incredibly important for getting us kind of those sneaky one-shot kills, but also getting us to the point where we're able to outvalue our opponents by just playing a ton of cards and then doubling them all up. So Mizzix is incredibly powerful and definitely worth a key card slot. And that'll lead us into our next key card, which is going to be Possibility Storm. So Possibility Storm is a bit weird to see in the key card section. And I'm not just putting it here because it is a one of my favorite cards. I won't say my favorite card, but definitely one of them. 
but Possibility Storm is three red red for an enchantment. Whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, that player exiles it, then exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a card that shares a card type with it. That player may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then they put all cards exiled with Possibility Storm on the bottom of their library in a random order. Which is a lot of text, but essentially if we cast Mizzix with Possibility Storm in play, we would exile Mizzix and then exile cards from the top of our deck until we hit another creature, and then we cast that creature for free. So the really important part of Possibility Storm, though, is that everything involved with it is exiled. So we cast Mizzix, we exile it, we reveal till we hit another creature, we exile that creature, then we cast that creature for free from exile. So every single time we cast a spell, we are getting to cast a different spell from exile triggering Nasari, putting a plus one plus one counter on him. That is incredibly powerful when we can turn every single card in our deck into an additional plus one plus one counter for Nasari, plus playing into some of the other themes that we have going on, some other cards that care about exile, being able to copy it with Mizzix, that kind of stuff. So Possibility Storm is great for that aspect, but at the same time, it also messes with what our opponents are doing because we know that we're built around not necessarily built around Possibility Storm, but built around a deck that has Possibility Storm in it. So we know that it could happen at any given time. And there's nothing in our deck that would be bad for us to really hit. Our opponents, however, aren't prepared for that. So there could be times when they're trying to counter a spell and they flip into card draw instead. So it can really mess up what our opponents are doing. It makes sure that what's in their hand isn't actually what's in their hand, and it makes it very difficult for them to play their game. But that is only key card number two. We got to move on to key card number three, and this one is going to be Keeper of Secrets. So I mentioned cards that care about casting from exile. Keeper of Secrets is definitely that kind of card because it is five and a red for a six, four demon. It's got first strike and haste. And whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, such as exile, Keeper of Secrets deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to target opponent. So once again, if we're casting a bunch of spells from exile, we are now doing a ton of damage to our opponents, and there's really nothing they're going to be able to do to stop it, other than maybe giving themselves hexproof, but I can't imagine that's going to come up super often in Commander. But if we're using something like Possibility Storm with Keeper of Secrets, every single spell we cast is getting exiled, and then we're casting a different spell from exile, doing that extra damage with Keeper of Secrets. And that can very quickly close out a game when we're casting multiple five to six mana value spells in a turn. So Keeper of Secrets really puts the gas on this deck and lets us do a ton of damage very, very quickly. And combined with Nasari, can really close out games a lot quicker than you might expect. So those are our key cards. And of course, the next thing we gotta do is take a look at some cool interactions for this deck. These are some cards that synergize very well together or really just work in a unique way that I want to highlight. So first up, we got to talk a little about, about Nelfeshni and Alrune's Epiphany. So Nelfeshni, five and a red for a four, six beast demon. It's got flying. Whenever you cast a spell from exile, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. If it's a permanent spell, that copy gains haste, and at the beginning of the end step, sacrifice this permanent. So it's very similar to Mizzix, but we don't have to pay for it. It just kind of happens. So if we can find a good spell to copy from Exile, such as, say, Alrune's Epiphany, which is five blue blue for a sorcery, create two one one blue bird creature tokens with flying, take an extra turn after this one, and exile Alrune's Epiphany, but we can foretell it for four blue blue. If we can copy that with Nalfeshni, we take two additional turns and make four birds. Plus, we already have an Nalfeshni, so that's a 4-6 flyer. Maybe we've already got Nasari, maybe we've got something like Mizzix or Keeper of Secrets, and we can really start to dish out a ton of damage. And with this deck, being able to play multiple spells in a turn and then take multiple turns makes it very difficult for us to lose the game. So Nalfeshni, great on its own. Elrune's Epiphany, great on its own. But together, we're taking two additional turns with four additional 1-1 flyers, and that's going to be very difficult for a lot of decks to beat when we can accrue so much value on every single one of our turns. But that is only cool interaction number one, so we got to move on to cool interaction number two, 
which is between Wild Magic Sorcerer and Mind's Dilation. So, Wild Magic Sorcerer, 3 and a red for a 4-3 Orc Shaman. The first spell you cast from exile each turn has Cascade. So, immediately very useful. And it's also very interesting to note, too, that if we Cascade into something, we exile cards from the top of our library until we exile a non-land card that costs less than the spell we cast. Then we cast that spell which was exiled, so that actually triggers all of our exile effects twice. But we're going to pair that up with Mind's Dilation, which is 5 blue blue for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts their first spell each turn, that player exiles the top card of their library. If it's a non-land card, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. It's very important to note that Nasari only cares about us casting stuff from exile. It doesn't say that we have to cast our stuff from exile. So Mind's Dilation lets us essentially cast something every single turn because it's going to be very unlikely that our opponents aren't casting spells on their turn. So they cast a spell, they reveal the top card of their library. If it's a non-land card, we cast it from exile for free. Then Wild Magic Sorcerer sees that we've cast our first spell from exile that turn because, again, that one doesn't have to be on our turn. Then we get to Cascade and cast something else from exile. So as long as our opponents are hitting non-land cards with Mind's Dilation, we are casting that, plus triggering Wild Magic Sorcerer, and casting something else. That's two free spells every single turn as we go around the table. So if every single player hits something, that means we are getting six free spells before we get back to our turn. That means if we have Nasari, we're getting six plus one plus one counters. If we have Keeper of Secrets, we're doing that much damage to each, well, not to each opponent, but probably spreading it out a little bit so some opponents are getting some damage. But either way, this is a ton of value that you really don't even have to pay that much mana for. Yeah, you've got to pay to get the Sorcerer and the Mind Stylation into play, but once you've done that, you can just kind of coast on the cards that they are putting into play for you. So a very cool interaction and definitely a very powerful interaction. But finally, that leads us to the end of our deck tech, and we got to talk a bit about the price. Now, when I first put this deck together, I was thinking, oh man, it's going to be super expensive. We're going to come way over our budget limit. But we actually came in pretty cheap because it turns out a lot of the Suspend and Foretell and Adventure cards are not a ton of money, so we could make this deck only about $60.68. And the vast majority of the price of this deck actually comes from Passionate Archaeologist, which is $8.90. So if you decided to trim down the price a little bit, you could actually cut it close to $50 just by cutting Passionate Archaeologist, which... We should probably read. Passion and Archaeologist is one and a red for a legendary enchantment. Background. Commander creatures you own have whenever you cast a spell from exile. This creature deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to target opponent. So essentially turns Nasari into a copy of Keeper of Secrets, but Nasari also keeps all of his other text as well. So Passion and Archaeologist is another great way for us to help close out the game, but it's not necessary for the deck. You can definitely win without it. So if you do need to trim it for budget purposes, you certainly could. On the other hand, though, if you're looking for a card to put into the deck that could maybe increase the power of it, but would unfortunately increase the budget as well, I do have a recommendation for you there too. So the card that I would recommend putting into the deck, if you can, is going to be Jessica's Will. Normally, I try to steer clear of suggesting what would be kind of classified as staple cards, cards that are just generically good in any deck. But I think Jessica's Will gets a bit of a pass for this one for one very specific reason, and that is because it exiles cards from your library and allows you to play cards from the top of your library. So essentially, it's two and a red for a sorcery that says choose one, but if you control a commander as you cast the spell, you choose both, which hopefully will have Nasari for this and you add a red for each card in target opponent's hand, or exile the top three cards of your library, and you may play them this turn. That is incredibly powerful with Nasari because we can get a ton of mana for our opponents and be able to cast stuff from exile, possibly casting up to three things from exile just in one turn. And that is exactly what this deck wants to be doing. 
it is a bit unfortunate that Jessica's will is $16.22. Yes, I know it could fit into the budget, but I didn't want to throw cards in just because they were super powerful. I wanted to make sure that I was really fine tuning the deck and I didn't want to throw in a staple card that I could just to kind of push the power level up. I thought that a $60 deck was a little bit more entertaining than that. So that is where we wound up. But if you are putting it in, then I would recommend taking out Embrith Shieldbreaker, which is one in a red for a 2-1 human knight. And it has an adventure, sorcery, battle display for one red, destroy target artifact. Now, I put this in here because it is an adventure card, and it is technically removal. Being able to destroy an artifact can be useful, but unfortunately, that's really all it does. It's just one mana to destroy an artifact, and there's not always a guarantee that there will be an artifact, and even if there is, you're then just casting a two mana, two, one, that, that's it. And you don't really want to be doing that in Commander. It's not really going to win you the game. It's not going to do too much. So... Even with all of our Exile synergies, this one really isn't that strong, and it's really only in here for the destroying a target artifact, but you could find other ways to do that too if that's what you wanted to do. So that is my recommendation for what to replace if you were to put in Jessica's Will. But that is it for our deck tech, and obviously we've talked all day about this deck, but we got to see how it actually performs in a game. So we are going to run this deck up against three opponents this week and find out just how good our exile strategy can be. So we are joined this week by Jason playing Ginger Taxius, Sean playing Treason the Infinite, and Bilal playing Shalai and Halar. So starting off with Jason and his Ginger Taxius deck, this is, from what I can understand, just kind of a blue control deck. He wants to draw a ton of cards, cast a ton of non-creature spells, and I don't think he's built super heavily around the front of Ginger Taxius as much as he is the Great Synthesis. So, like I said, he wants to draw a ton of cards, which is exactly what he wants with Great Synthesis, and then return all non-Phyrexian creatures to their owner's hands, make sure that he's the only one with any creatures, and then he gets to cast a bunch of spells for free from his hand. And that's really where the value is, and I think that's really what he wants to be doing. So I am a little bit concerned about this. Control is kind of Jason's specialty, along with, you know, maybe Aristocrats, but considering he's in mono blue, it's most likely just going to be Control. Um, but I do think that that is a concern because our deck really wants to be casting big spells in a turn, not necessarily a ton of little ones. So I think that if he's holding up any interaction or counter spells or anything like that, it's going to be a bit of a problem for our deck. So I am a little bit worried about that right from the get go. Next up, we have Sean with Trazen the Infinite, which is as much as I can tell another combo potentially card. He wants to basically use a bunch of artifacts to put them into his graveyard and then use the activated abilities of those artifacts that are now technically on Trazen to do probably some sort of shenanigans. I don't know of any infinite combos off the top of my head, but considering his commander is called Trazen the Infinite, I have to imagine there's at least one infinite combo with this. So I'm very interested to see how that goes, but I don't 100% know what to expect. So I am kind of excited for that one. And then finally, we have Shalai and Halar being played by Bilal. And this one I know for a fact is a combo commander. So if I have to pick one of the three to be the most afraid of at the beginning, it is definitely Shalai and Halar. And Bilal is very upfront about his decks being very combo-centric. He knows that there are a ton of combos in this deck. He was very honest with us when he was talking about it. So I am very concerned about that because there's not much that we can really do for combos. We do have a little bit of interaction, but most of our interaction is pretty expensive. So if he can combo off pretty quickly, then it's definitely going to be a problem for us. So I do think Bilal's deck is the most concerning at the table when we're sitting down. But let me know in the comments what you think. Is there another deck that you have seen go off that I should be more concerned about? I've never played against any of these commanders before this game, so we'll see how it goes. I hope you all enjoy it. If you do, please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I will talk to you all once the game is done. At the start of the game, Jason goes first, followed by myself, Sean, and then Bilal. Before the game starts, though, Bilal puts a Leyline of Sanctity into play since he had it in his opening hand, gaining Hexproof. Then on Jason's first turn, he plays an Island. I play a Lonely Sandbar. Sean plays a Swamp. Bilal plays a Forest. Jason plays a Coral Atoll, returning an untapped island to his hand. 
I play a Forgotten Cave and cast Soul Ring, and then use the Soul Ring to foretell a card. Sean plays a Swamp. Bilal plays a Forest and casts Sylvan Library, letting him draw three cards in his upkeep, but lose four life for each card he keeps beyond one. Jason plays an Island and casts Sapphire Medallion, making all his blue spells cost one less, then casts Baral, Chief of Compliance, making his instants and sorceries cost one less, and also drawing him a card whenever he counters a spell. On my turn, I play a Mountain and cast my commander, Nasari, Dean of Expression, exiling the top card of each player's library in my upkeep, letting me cast any spell exiled this way, and also putting a plus one plus one counter on Nasari whenever I cast a spell from exile. Sean plays a Swamp, then casts Milliken. When Bilal draws for his turn, he puts two back, losing no life then casts Farseek, searching his library for a land and putting it into play tapped, then plays a Temple of Triumph, scrying one. Jason casts Ristic Study, drawing a card whenever an opponent casts a spell unless they pay an additional mana. He then attacks Bilal for one with Baral. In my upkeep, each opponent exiles the top card of their library, exiling an island, a mountain, and a chronomancer, letting me cast any of them until the end of turn. Then I cast Mizzix's Replica Rider, paying for Ristic Study, letting me pay an additional 2 mana whenever I cast a spell from anywhere other than my hand, copying it, and, if it's a permanent, sacrificing it at the end of turn. I then attack Bilal for 4 with Nasari, and pass. Sean plays a Cabal Stronghold and casts Feed the Swarm, not paying for Ristic Study, so Jason draws a card, destroying the Ristic Study, and then Sean loses 3 life since its mana value is 3. Once that's resolved, Sean casts Flayed One, milling 3 cards when it enters play. When Bilal draws for his turn, he puts two cards back, losing no life, then casts Circuitous Root, searching his library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. Then at the end of turn, Jason casts Frantic Search, drawing two cards, discarding two cards, and untapping up to three lands. On Jason's turn, he plays an island and casts a Mind Stone, then passes. In my upkeep, Nasari exiles Peer into the Abyss, Worn Power Stone, and a Mountain from my opponent's libraries. I then cast Creative Technique, demonstrating it, so Jason and I both make copies of it. This lets both of us reveal cards from the top of our libraries until we reveal a non-land card, exiling it, and then casting it. My copy of the spell resolves first, letting me cast Visions of Phyrexia, exiling the top card of my library in my upkeep, letting me cast it for the turn, and making a Power Stone token if I don't cast a spell from exile that turn, also putting a counter on Nasari. Then Jason's copy resolves, letting him cast Contentious Plan, proliferating, drawing a card, and putting a counter on Nasari. And finally, my original spell resolves, letting me cast Arcane Signet, putting yet another counter on Nasari, then I move to combat, attacking Sean for 4 with Mizzix, and Bilal for 7 with Nasari. On Sean's turn, he attacks me for 4 with the Flayed One, gaining 4 life, then cast Final Parting, searching his library for two cards, putting one into his hand and the other into his graveyard. This winds up with him putting Patchwork Gnomes into his graveyard, then he passes. When Bilal draws for turn, he keeps two cards, losing four life, then plays a Command Tower and casts Fey Burrow Elder, followed up by casting Imperial Recruiter, searching his library for a creature with power two or less, in this case, Dose in the Falling Leaf, putting it into his hand. Then at the end of turn, Jason casts Stroke of Genius for X equals 2, drawing 2 cards. On Jason's turn, he casts Thought Vessel, gaining no maximum hand size, and casts his commander, Gingitaxius, letting him draw a card when he casts a non-creature spell, mana value 3 or greater. In my upkeep, I exile a mountain from my library, while my opponents exile Technomancer, Dockside Extortionist, and Alrune's Epiphany. I then cast Bilal's Dockside Extortionist from exile, putting a counter on Nasari, and paying two mana with Mizzix to copy it. This makes two Docksides, each of which creates seven treasures when they enter, since my opponents control seven total artifacts and enchantments. Once that's resolved, I cast Keeper of Secrets, letting me do damage to an opponent equal to the mana value of any spell I cast from anywhere other than my hand. 
This lets me cast Jason's Alruns Epiphany, copying it, doing 7 damage to Jason, taking 2 additional turns after this, and creating 4 1-1 bird tokens. I then move to combat and attack Sean for 10 with Nasari, and Bilal for 11 with everything else. He blocks the copy of Dockside with the Vaporo Elder, killing the token and taking 10 total damage. Then I pass to myself, and everyone exiles a card from the top of their library, exiling Zalfir and Void, Mountain, Forest, and Slaughter Pact. I cast Sean's Slaughter Pact, copying it with Mizzix to destroy both of Jason's creatures, even paying for the ward for Gingitaxius, and putting another counter on Nasari. I then attack Bilal for 8 in the air, Jason for 7, and Sean for 11 with Nasari, knocking him out with commander damage. I then pass to another of my extra turns, and in my upkeep, everyone exiles a card, exiling a plains, to Fairy's Insight, and Rousing Refrain. Then I also pay for Slaughter Pact with my remaining treasures, not losing the game to the delayed trigger, and cast Rousing Refrain, making 6 red mana since Jason has 6 cards in hand, doing 5 damage to him and putting a counter on Nasari. This allows me to attack Bilal for 6 and Jason for 20, doing exactly lethal damage to both of them, knocking them both out, and winning me the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. I think it really showed off the power of Nasari, but more than anything, I think it actually showed off the power of our opponent's decks, because we really didn't win off the back of our own creatures, we won off the back of our opponents. And it was super cool to be able to steal Bilal's Dockside Extortionist, which was way out of our budget limit, and also steal Jason's Alruns Epiphany, which, while we have in our deck, it was kind of nice to just take someone else's and use it. So very cool to be able to do that. And I was also very impressed by the fact that Nasari got big enough to actually take Sean out of the game in just two attacks. I didn't expect Nasari to be able to do that, but very, very cool to see. So I'm very happy with this deck. I'm very impressed with how it performed. I can't think of any major upgrades that I would make right now to it. If you can think of any upgrades to it, please do let me know in the comments. I would love to hear any suggestions. I'm not a big is it player. Um, well, blue in general, I'm not super high on. So please do let me know if there's anything I might have missed. Otherwise, of course, we got to talk about our opponent's decks as well. Sean's Trazen deck, unfortunately, didn't get a chance to really do too much. I think that he spent a lot of time trying to set up for future turns, and then unfortunately couldn't get to those future turns. So hopefully we get to see that deck come back in the future. And then Bilal was also trying to set up for a combo on his turn. He was making sure that nobody could cast spells on his turn with Dosen. He had thought about actually tutoring out the Dockside instead of Dosen and decided against it, which is pretty funny considering I immediately hit Dockside afterwards. So I think that if he had had one or two more turns, he probably also could have just won the game. And then finally, of course, Jason's deck. He got a little stuck on mana, even though all of his spells cost significantly less because of his medallion and because of Baral and things like that. I think that if he had had a few more turns to also probably set up, he probably could have done quite a bit. I think he would have drawn quite a few cards and maybe gotten to the point where he had flipped Gingitaxius, but we didn't get to see that. So again, I hope we get to see that deck in the future as well. But overall, very happy with the game, very happy with how our deck performed, and hopefully we get to see our opponent's decks again, because the only real showing that they got was when we cast their spells. So hopefully they all come back in the future, but let me know in the comments what you thought of the game, let me know what you thought of the deck, and of course, please let me know if you have any suggestions for future cards that you would like to see turned into videos for this channel. And with all of that being said, hope you all enjoyed it, I know I certainly did. And I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.